Hello, everybody. On today's episode, I have on a guest who has traveled the world playing in a rock band. He has recently moved from Jersey City playing guitar and is now living on a farm in Georgia. Everybody, welcome Dan the Manifester to the show. I'm so pleased I finally got uh, I got to be on your show and I got the uh, your applause that you always do. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, you know, for the audience, uh, just so you know, Dan uh, was my first client through the website, and it was very exciting. Uh, we met uh, last week, and we uh, chatted for a little bit, and then, you know, we got to work together a few days later, and we've been in touch ever since, and uh, it's a budding friendship, and it's wonderful. Yeah, it was a, a really great session. Um, I'm still, I remember going to sleep after our meditation session and I, I just couldn't, I was up for, for hours just buzzing with energy. Yeah, actually, now that you say that, I couldn't sleep like all this week, three days in a row. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I couldn't fall asleep. And usually I fall asleep fairly easy. You know, I'm out mm -hmm. within 10 minutes, but this week, you know, I was it was taking me a while to uh, go to sleep and take me a while to wake up. I felt like this week was very, very heavy. Yeah, there was a, uh, it's, it's a bumpy week for sure. I know everyone here on the farm has had uh, their own tests to deal with. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, my daughter is sick. One of my stepdaughters uh, is sick. Uh, you know, I had to pick, well, Mimi uh, and Mimi's here, everybody. Hello, hello. I didn't give her the proper introduction, so. Is that the proper introduction? The signature <laughs> intro. Yeah, yeah, that is Mimi's intro for now on. Uh oh. Mama Mimi. Okay. It's the kids. <laughs> um, but Maya, my daughter, called me or texted me at school today because she wasn't feeling well. So uh, Mimi had to go get her. Uh, before she they made her get COVID tested because I'm not having them stick a thing up her nose, you know. Yeah, but, absolutely. Yeah, so we just got her home and I gave her some vitamin C and she took a nap and she was just bouncing around outside. I, I made a fire and she came out and she's like, I feel so much better. And I was like, well, yeah, it's the vitamin C. You know, you got a little boost of it. You just got to, you know, be careful with it. Yeah, we are uh, a living terrain yeah we and i'm take care of right i'm seeing it more and more with how all of the uh what we call sickness is actually just the purging of toxins you know all of our chakras are filled with different toxins and this is the time where the earth is really taking it out of us you know this that's the ascension process is you know, if you're coughing a lot, it's your throat. If uh, it's your nasal passageway, it's your third eye. You know, if it's your stomach, it's your solar plexus or your sacral chakra. You know, if you have to go to the bathroom, that's probably your root and your sacral. You know, those. it, it depends on what area. Headaches will be your crown chakra. You know, tightness in the chest is your heart chakra. You know, those, these are how it's manifesting in us. And... I, I realized that once when I was sick two weeks ago, I was sick for a day, my nose wouldn't stop running. And uh, I took Alka-Seltzer, you know, it was an Alka-Seltzer type of vitamin C thing. You just throw it in your drink, drink it, and I was cleared. But I could feel that it was dripping from my third eye. And the more I was around people, the more consciousness as I was around, the more it was leaking. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's ever since the night of our meditations and you brought me a little bit more like access to the to the chakras and awareness and you know you showed me a, a way to meditate that was a way that I was completely different than what I was doing before I it's really enjoyable to focus every morning on each particular one and sort of bring the energy from root from the bottom all the way up all the way up and then you know I really I know a lot of times you like to ask about what are some of the grounding things you like to do at the end of your episodes? But I feel like starting starting a morning with a meditation that could potentially be very powerful is uh, it's just one of the most grounding things I've done lately. Besides working out at this uh, gym they just set up here at the farm, wow. those two things are my 
Well, thank you so much for the high praise. Uh, I mean, you're a world traveled rock star and you know you're you're saying these things to me it's very humbling to me and i feel very warm and welcome uh, and i feel appreciated which is you know it's uh it's amazing the life the, the difference in my life now versus two three four five six years ago uh but b back to what you were saying real quick before we move on how has your meditation's been because you as you said this is a new meditation for you that i showed you this new way and you know how what's happening in your meditations that feels different sure so the meditation i was well when i was introduced to it i i wound up going to uh maybe this was around 2008 2009 i was living in brooklyn and i went to a temple called the fire lotus temple and um it was right in the heart of brooklyn uh, I forget the train stop, Hoyt Skimmerhorn stop off the A and the C train. And um, I would go there every morning at about 6 a.m. and meditate. And, you know, when you're learning from scratch, there's it, it could be quite challenging. Um, but the whole point of that specific type of Zen meditation is to, at least when you're a beginner, just to bring focus and be able to observe your breath and allow any observations to come in and re release them and observe them. You know, you don't hold on to them. You don't try to force them away. You just let them happen and, and then let them go all while trying to observe your breath. And at the beginning, you count. Um, so I was doing that meditation for quite a while. And then I put a pause on my meditation uh, practice. And then around, I, I bet you hear this a lot from people, around the spring of 2020, uh all of a sudden i had to start meditating again um for various reasons that we can get into um but i went right back to it and it felt like just sliding back into a warm pool of water where it just felt right and it was helping me strengthen myself and become clear and become more observant um to a point and i know there are levels of meditation and i started to feel stagnant um so rather than beat my head against the wall and try to do the same thing, I said, maybe let me pivot. And then I heard your podcast. I think it was on zero, Sam Tripoli zero. Yeah. Yeah. I heard your episode and I was just so floored by the description of your meditation uh, experience and the process you go through it. And you're talking more about chakras. And I said, wow, this sounds like something that will energize my meditation. Totally different shake it up a little bit so i reached out to you and um and yeah you were gracious enough to take me on that journey with you uh, well you know it it was something that i struggled with was uh charging people money uh, i'll say that because it, there is a certain feel for money that i had for a while and then i spoke to several different uh, people on the show who started you know, started undoing that because it was some kind of trauma that I held against money and there was something there that I was holding it in a negative light that oh I can't do this for money and then it was Amy Belair had her free master class uh, I forget exactly what it was called but to where she invited I think it was like 30 of us that ended up being on the zoom call and it was a little live q a and it was like an introductory thing to what her, her, her new master class. yeah her new master class so it was like the, the yeah i heard cool. about that on a podcast yeah so uh right at the end she did a q a and i asked her a few questions and it just clicked for me and and hearing her speak on it a few times really helped me get over it because I was at a place where I was like, no, I want to give this to everybody for free. Everybody should be able to do this for free. But she said there has to be an exchange of energy. You have to have some skin in the game. You know, people, if you're just giving away something, pearls, if you're just throwing pearls, to the homeless casting you know, pearls to swine right okay that's what you said yeah right if, if if you're just giving that away to people who don't have any respect for it then it it's worthless 
So you're making it worthless by giving it away for free. So then I was like, you know what? I and I want to show the universe that this is what I really want to do. And when I was, you know, when I was doing it for free for people, it would be like in my personal life, I'd be like, hey, you know, what's going on? And and most of the time when I do things, people don't know. I don't even, I never say something to them. I just work on people because they come to me in meditation and I just work on them. I just, I've been doing it for a, well over a year now. And I, I, w- I still do that. You know, I would never stop doing that. But I wanted to work with people. And, you know, for me to then, a- as soon as she did that, the next day, I got this, what people call downloads. I got this download of what I'm going to make my website. So then, boom, I, I made it on my website. And then there was something else, like, two days later that was like, oh, you're not only going to do that, but you're going to do kundalini awakenings as well and then i got a whole thing of that and uh you know now i'm working on the membership part of my website that i was doing tonight which why i was late uh getting the zoom call together uh but just so many things are coming to me because i unlocked it and it's all thanks to amy well several people helped along the way but you know amy really helped me understand that it's an energetic exchange when you did that you now have energy into it and you know it's not a lot of money and and it is but it is worth you know the energy that i'm giving off and the all the things that you get in return from it you know i feel that that's a a a very fair price uh for the things that i'm doing so you know you're making me rethink uh the idea that i had which is so I'm at here at a farm called White Oak Pastures, and I'm helping raise sheep and goats. So it's a, it's an amazing experience. I got, um, you know, you can call it luck or you can call it divine intervention, but I'm here, and um, I, I was thinking the other day, like, and what brought me thinking about this was, like, the tax implications. Like, what if I just donated lamb to people, like, give it away, if they, and then they donate to me? in exchange but i don't know if that's coming from a pure enough place or the you the way you're thinking about the way you explain the energy exchange makes sense but i was thinking of that in terms of tax implications so yeah well yeah i and you know when i first started i didn't want to do it because i was like oh then there's going to be taxes and you know i don't want to have to deal with that that was just like an obstacle i set there for myself to then hurdle over that obstacle and be like look how you know, look how good I am. I got over that obstacle, but it wasn't an obstacle. It was something I put there, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, but what you're saying is much different, uh, in that, uh, so you're saying donate land to people and they donate a lamb. Uh Oh, a lamb. Okay. Yeah. Like in other words, like for, for my big dream one day to have a, like a homestead and I have, let's say 30, 50, 300 lambs. And I, I, I package them, I process them, I harvest them, all that. And then I put up on my website, um, you know, contact me and I will gift you some lamb. And then you can donate to me the value this is providing to you. Okay. Like an exchange. So it is an exchange, but like you said, throwing, uh, casting pearls to swine, you know. But there there are plenty of farms that do what's called, um, I guess it's almost like a, I'm using the wrong term, but a a donation box in their farm. So they'll have a freezer. If they're in a, re- a very rural area, they'll have a freezer out in their barn full of meat and suggested prices on each one and a box to put cash or a thing to put some to exchange online, like a, a code. And all the people that I heard who, who are doing that always make more than what they would have charged Right, because you're value. leaving it up to people who are uh, kind-hearted, loving people who want to then pay it back. And even the, those who pay less than or don't pay at all, you know, it gets repaid by others. Right. So I was thinking about that. That's a that. really good idea. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it works. It's just also a very practical thing. It works in a rural setting, you know, when you can't always, people can't always be at certain places at certain times. You know, it's just 
easier just to leave a big freezer full of meat and pay as you go. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's super cool. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of uh, places and things that, you know, they recommend $10, but they're not, or recommend a donation of $10, but it's not really a recommendation. It's kind of like mandatory, you know, that type of thing. But so it is, uh, it can be beneficial. And for what you're saying, you know, I, I like that idea for you. That feels like it's something that you really have your heart behind, that you want to do this, and I say, go do it. You know, whatever is leading you, go do it. Yeah, the the implication of it was frightening, so I know that's generally a good feeling. When you, when you think, like, oh, how could I possibly do that? That's generally the direction you want to head. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so let's get to your... Uh, you know, not to make a hard left turn or anything, but let's get to your uh, touring. That is super yes. interesting to me. So you were on a world tour. You said, what, 40 countries? Yeah, so it wasn't all in one shot, but, um, right. you know, we would do... So we were... The band is called the Kennedy Administration. Uh, we're a jazz, R&B, funk, soul kind of band, and we play all these jazz festivals and... You know, I I wasn't an original member of the band. The band has kind of been evolving over time, and based out of, they're based out of New York City, and I would always go and watch them, and I knew I knew the musicians. And um, at some point, I got asked to do a substitute gig for their guitar player, and I subbed with him, and I started playing with them. And before I even before I even got to the gig, I made a point to learn their entire album by memory before getting there, the first oh, one. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I got there, and I played the gig, and I had all the songs memorized, and after that point, I started playing with them more regularly, and at a, a later date, they asked me to join the band. This was maybe, I don't, I can't even remember how many years ago, maybe six or so. Um, so yeah, that was a, a great experience, and it was just around that time that they had done their first tour after the album, their first album dropped and it was very popular in the jazz scene. And I got to hop on tour with them for, for the last few years. Um, we've been, yes, yeah, so we've been to about 40 different countries. Um, I never thought I would be able to travel the world in the capacity that I did, but um, it's a fantastic experience and it's a, it's also a very challenging lifestyle if you're kind of a homebody or somebody who likes routine. Um, you know, routine is not an option. Every day is different. Every location is different. Um, but what you have are the people around you, and it really truly turns into a family. Um, I think that's the most special aspect of music is the if you do get to be part of a regular band or group, the the connection that you make with each other is almost otherworldly um especially on the musical realm when you're on stage and it, it's equivalent to channeling like you're you're standing there and you're watching yourself you're having an out of body experience and you're just moving with the music and it's surrounding you and you're out of body and you're just watching it happen and you you can't believe it's real and it is real and you're you're still doing it <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah so let's talk about that let's talk about being on stage and having uh hundreds and thousands not hundreds of thousands but hundreds or thousands of people watching you and participating and they're giving you their energy and you're giving them energy and there's probably this feeling like you were just saying the out of body feeling how difficult is you is it for you to stay in the moment and be playing precisely uh you know what's that process like right um it's it's not difficult to stay in the moment when you have a very good connection to the, your band members and to the music and especially to the energy of the crowd. If, if everything lines up correctly, it's very easy to do. But when something energetically becomes off, let's say if there was a rift between bandmates or even something as simple, you know, you had a really bad night of sleep and you had to learn a new song and you're just not doing so well at it. You know, those types of things can throw it off. But um, I would say the 
the biggest energy exchange between band members and the audience for me has been like the medium size rooms, like maybe a few hundred people because it's intimate enough where the people in the audience are receiving all of the energy with no interference and, and you're getting it right back from them. Like you can hear someone right there say something or move. Um, and then when you start doing the audience interaction, singing, the clapping, the call and the response, like it just becomes this cycle and it keeps growing, getting deeper as the night goes on. The bigger and bigger venues that you play, the more isolated that you become from your audience and you just kind of have to, I'd say, generate the energy from the stage in faith because you're not really getting a, as big of a or as visceral of a, of a response from the audience. The lights are brighter, they're fainter, they're farther away. It's scarier because there's a whole bunch more people. There's that fright aspect of it. Um, yeah, so that's what I'd say. So how was it getting over that fright? Is Did you ever get caught up in it and it overwhelm you? Yes. Yeah. It's, uh, there, there were times, and to me, the most frightening times were uh, when you're playing in an extremely intimate scenario and everyone is dead on listening to you. Uh, I think one of my most intense moments was when I was in graduate school at Queens College I was studying jazz performance and really focusing on playing solo jazz guitar, like all the moving parts, just me playing the melody, chords, improvising, all that. And one of our teachers um, at the school was bass player Ron Carter. Ron Carter was Miles Davis's bass player, among many, many, many others. He's, he's known as the most recorded bass player of all time. And um, Wow. Yeah, his wife, Quintel, asked me if I wanted to play at their apartment on the Upper West Side for their Valentine's Day dinner. Oh, my and goodness. I accepted, and it was, it was three hours of me playing by myself with breaks for Ron, his wife, and maybe four other guests. Wow. And, you know, you talk about that's like the highest level of uh, – anxiousness you have to overcome it's, it's very intense um but through that i realized my the best way i could be of service as a guitar player is as a band member i like being part of a team of a group of a crew um that really strengthens me um i also like to play by myself for fun for myself but in terms of performing and putting the music out there i like when i have support and i like when i'm contributing to something bigger than myself okay okay that's that's so cool you know to to be invited for uh an audience of six and this guy and you play bass that's what you play uh a regular electric guitar six okay. string Okay. Yeah, and um, I, I played multiple Valentine's Days at his house after that. It was wow. quite an honor. Yeah. Well, that sounds amazing. It, it sounds like, uh, you know, they were a big fan of your music. Yeah. We, yeah we, wow. We, we remained in good relationship and talked afterwards. Wow. That's, that's incredible. Uh, you know, having conversations with people that have accomplished the things you know, like this, that I'm getting to then experience in my own way because I our consciousness is mixed. And when you're telling the story of when you were talking about the intimate setting versus the setting of when there's a lot of people, I could feel the energy shift and you were like backed away. And I could see with whatever memory you had in mind, I could see mm -hmm. it and it backed you know, the whole stage backed away and, you know, everyone was yeah. further away. I could say it all. So I'm getting to experience these memories as people are telling me their stories. And it's just amazing. Yeah. Music is really the, I think one of the purest art forms that reflects reality and consciousness as it truly is like cymatics and vibration. Yeah, and everything's light. frequency. Yeah. Everything is frequency and music is, I, in my opinion, the most pure form of expression of, of consciousness. Yeah, well, hey, let's look at quantum physics. They say that nothing is stationary until you observe it. 
So the only reason we're stationary, we're physical, we're solid, is because we're observing it. You know, to those who aren't observing it, we're just vibrating up and down. A, a, all of our cells are just continually moving. And I've experienced this through uh, mushrooms, through cactus, through regular meditation, uh, through my own thoughts of how does quantum physics apply to myself and my body? How does consciousness, how does that all apply? And what does rendering actually mean when people are talking about simulation theory? And when I'm having all these thoughts, I'm coming to the conclusion, oh, quantum physics says that we're vibrating. We're always moving. We're always vibrating. And that's why, you know, when sometimes when you're on shrooms, if you know, you feel taller, sometimes you feel shorter, sometimes you feel, you know, you you look in the mirror and you're changing. It's because we're only stationary because we're observing it. We're not actually stationary. You know, if we were to somehow like close these eyes and open this eye, we would yeah. see what they call uh in ancient times what they called people whose skin turned of fire. You know, they they thought that these people were on fire. It's the astral world. It's the astral body. It's always moving. When when we were doing our meditation and um we got past all the chakras to the crown chakra and it was so active. We were doing breathing and holding and squeezing. And then we got to this moment of repose where I could finally just sit back and observe. And I felt I was this glowing golden orb with vibrating light rays just coming, pulsing from all over me. That's, that's exactly what I was at that moment. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's intense. It's a, uh... You know, you described it as a a workout in your review, and I, I put this up on the website. Uh, it says that it was a physical and spiritual thing, and, and it was like a workout that you said that you, mm -hmm. you know, and I never really looked at it that way, but it, it is that, you know, that's how I, I, I move the energy through myself and others, and, you know, it is a physical thing. This is my first time exploring meditation on this side of the coin. Like, you know, you, you look at yoga and things like that where you're where you're actively squeezing. I learned a technique. I, I checked it out online, but I've been incorporating it into my meditation. And you were doing it with me, and I just didn't know. But where you're squeezing your the muscles of your root chakra, your sacral chakra, and you're, you breathe in to your stomach, and you suck in, and you send all that energy up and you look at your third eye, and you hold, and you squeeze, and I heard it called the big draw, and you're sending it all up to the top, and yeah, it, 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 it is a more physical form of meditation than I've been used to, and it's, uh, it's just that kind of energetic shift that I was looking for. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, it's some really good stuff. It's at all the different breathing techniques that I've learned, all the different meditative techniques that I've learned. Uh, and as I tell everybody, I'm extreme with everything I do. So when I learn a new method, you know, I can learn. It'll take me a week to learn what might take people a few months. Uh, so I don't need to spend a, a ton of time doing it because I just pick up what I need to and then I leave the rest. So I, I've kind of put this together through all my different learning teachings and i when you were telling me this i didn't realize and it, it does sometimes it takes me to connect with others to real to actually realize that oh this isn't what people are doing when they meditate you know when people are asking you know right. how do, like this isn't normal people don't you know i picked this up and i just did it you know other everyone else is like not everybody else, but most people are like, uh, I, you know, I can't clear my head. I can't do, I'm just like, Oh, I'll clear it for you. You know, I'll move the energy. I don't, I right. didn't, I don't realize all the time that it is, this is different than what the general sense of people who meditate are doing. Yeah. I, the, I explained to you the way I was feeling particularly stagnant was I, w I felt like I was, it was just clear, like, I was talking about emptying myself out and I felt like I had emptied a vessel that needed to be filled and the way that you showed me how to do it, um, you, you know, I've never done any particular type of like Indian lineage of meditation, but 
the, from what I'm learning, this is the closest I've come to it, and it's much more of a physical body thing, and um, it fills the void that um, the sort of Zen, Vipassana, mindful, clearing, observant thing, it just does it in a different way, and um, mm -hmm. I feel like they work well together. I do both in the meditation every morning. There's moments where I sit and I observe, and there's a moment when I breathe and squeeze and s manipulate the chi, as it yeah. were. Yeah, that, that's what exactly what I go for. You know, I want to get clear because I, I look at meditation. I've done, you know, what you were saying with the uh, uh, clearing out and observing it and doing that. But I like to go to the next level. There's another level of that, and it's riding your imagination. And going on these adventures that I talk about, you know, when me and my cattle tag team an, an alligator, you know, those types of things. <laughs> me, me and my daughter will, you know, travel to the, you know, Pleiades and, and you know, slaughter something, you know, like these types of things are just like things that occur to me. They're when I get to the observation point, you know, there's no, it's no yes. longer empty in my mind. Well, I don't want to say that my mind no one's mind is ever empty, but it's not my reptile brain that's carrying the thought. It's my imagination is so plugged in that mm -hmm. I am just observing my imagination at work. And the more I observe my imagination, the more I can relate it to the physical because I'm observing the physical things that are happening around me. I mean, we, Mimi, uh, I mean, we, we meditated this morning and we heard a, a dog bark way off in the distance. And then I said, you know, uh, as we start to, like, it was so peaceful. I mean, it was completely peaceful. Mm -hmm. There was not a sound. And I said, just observe it. I said, and now uh, pay attention. When we start to have a, a little thought, things start to happen. And then a bird starts tweet, tweeting. And I was like, all right. And you hear that bird tweeted only after I spoke. And then I was like, and now we're going to hear a dog bark. And then a dog started barking. And it was a little bit closer. And then I'm like, all right, now that the thought is coming closer to us, now we're going to hear something else. Then we hear a squirrel up in the tree doing something, and it was even closer. So it's like as we're going on and on, I can show people, look, your thoughts are doing this in the physical world. You know, we don't look at it in that manner. But when you do the meditations that I do is I want to get to that imagination point. I want to get to that imagination point and that physical understanding. And the way to do it is you have to clear out them chakras. You have to nonstop clear them out, clear, clear, clear. And once they're clear, it's no longer that, oh, I'm observing nothingness. It's now I'm observing everything. It's I am becoming one with my environment. Mm-hmm. That's a great explanation. Um, I would also describe it the way it feels in my body is I feel like um building a tower almost. It's almost like my chakras, almost like they're nascent and haven't even formed in a way. Like my root, you know, starting there, it feels solid. I could feel it. But then learning how to develop the sacral chakra and focusing on that, like I feel it form. And then I feel it stack on top of the root, and they're connected. But all of the others are still kind of wobbly and floating around. And then I go up to the, uh, the solar plexus, and I really feel it, and I put my energy there, and I hold it, and I pay attention to it. And all of a sudden, I feel it click like a building, and it just stacks right on to the sacral chakra. And I feel like this, like you were talking about the S-curve, like it starts here, goes forward, comes back. And then, you know, I feel my heart chakra. Yep, there it is. It's stacked perfectly like that when you, you, as you're saying, you know, it goes straight up. Yeah. And recently I've been feeling my heart almost turn into a big green shield, like a breastplate that sits on top of the bottom three. Okay. And then um, my throat is like a little indigo ball. And... um. The third eye, once I hit the third eye, that's when the realm of the imagination really starts to begin, I feel like, because it's so centered on all the others and it doesn't move. Mm -hmm. And then when I get to the crown, 
that one is still the newest to me and i'm it's almost like a, a vapor a, a vapor fog a cloud and i try to picture it coming down and going up through it sometimes just being stable and staying there um but eventually they all click and connect and i embody all of it and my mental and my physical kind of click together and there's no more division it's all one that's perfect did you have something to say yeah. uh, okay i thought mimi was jumping I'm in here i'm just listening <laughs> um yeah so uh i i did want to ask uh one more question about the the playing music is yeah. so when you get to that point of nervousness and, mm -hmm. and uh fear or you know that fight or flight mode what would help you get over to snap back into the moment to keep playing sure um there's some techniques that you can do um a lot of people will focus their attention on something close and familiar to them um so instead of just putting all of your attention outside with you you bring it down in front of you or to someone close by and you focus your physical attention on that object um what I would do a lot of the times, I would you, you can't get over it in the moment unless you practice getting over it in practice. So a lot of times, I would pick up my instrument and envision in my mind the fearful scenario that would be, right? And I wouldn't practice a whole song. I would practice like the first note of that song, the intention, the feeling that I would want to feel while thinking of that scenario that possibly scared me the most. Mm -hmm. And so it was an intention practice. I was barely playing music. You're just running that scenario and putting the feeling of that first moment that you touch the instrument, that first note that rings out. Um, I would practice that a lot and that that helped out. Wow, that's a, a big manifestation type of deal. Mm -hmm. that's yeah, a, that's a, like, you know, when you're, when you're learning your instrument or your craft or whatever your craft is, you know, you always start from the beginning, you learn the techniques, you learn some songs, you learn some bigger and bigger, bigger concepts, and then eventually you hit a wall that seems insurmountable. And for a lot of performers, it's anxiety or fear. And um, that's when you get to, you know, you, you study with masters that are, you know, a college or a private teacher or someone that will show you these techniques. And it's the mind game. It's the mind and body connection. It's not, you're not playing music anymore. You're addressing a bigger picture. Right, right. Uh, did you have something you were saying? No, I was just going to, I was just thinking that that is sort of the trick of a hypnotist uh, that I was taught is, you know, if you were going to do something you were scared of, say a job interview or a playing in front of hundreds of people, uh, you envision that scene playing out in your head, like you said, and then you pretend to draw down, you know, like a black screen to kind of replay. Now play it again. Pull down the screen, play it again. And you keep doing that until you're happy with how it went. <laughs> and then you go in and you do it for real. You know, it's like playtime's over. It's time exactly. to do it for real. The first time I ever did that, I was reading an article written by a teacher at the Juilliard School of Music. He's a classical musician, and this applies to everyone. It doesn't matter what you play. And I, I read it, and I tried it because I was having some anxiety problems creeping up. And the first day I did it, I noticed a change immediately. It just It was just instant um but i guess for if it's a scenario you're not as familiar with like i'm familiar with music i was able to integrate it rather quickly but if it's a if it's a less than familiar scenario it might take some more time but i think the technique it proved to work for me yep i i used it for for a big job interview i was like i'm not sure if i can get this i'm not sure if i'm qualified and he's like you go in there and you you know, you imagine yourself confident, you, you know what you're going to say, you know how it's going to go, and then you replay it, replay it, replay it until it's time to go in. And, and uh, you know, for anybody listening, I, I'm asking him this, and I hope that those who, uh, are under, who need the information are understanding that 
this is things you can do when you get debilitating anxiety not maybe not even debilitating but one step before that when you get really bad anxiety in the moment i know for a lot of people they want to shut down and they you know it's i don't want to deal with this i want to run away you know so that's why I, i'm asking you this so that anyone who feels that because anxiety is you can overcome it and you don't need medicine to do it you can overcome anything through the power of the mind and this is a great great technique that you're doing yeah and it it takes someone with the eyes to see to you know to be someone who wants to pick up the ball and run with it in order to do that you know the the pharmaceutical way of dealing with things is so it's so easy and the it's easy button. Uh, I've dealt I've dealt with that with people in my family for my whole life and they just never get off the train of uh of of that kind of medication and um but you know you talk about dealing with the anxiety and in the moment is the hardest time to do it so these mm -hmm. little practical exercises like you know meditation journaling all those kinds of things and 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 this visualization things like will help you face that moment with much greater clarity Right. And, and what helps me is when I recognize that I'm in the moment of whatever it is that I'm trying to work on, say, I'm trying to work on my anger. I've been, you know, maybe me and my daughter haven't been getting along. This isn't true or anything, but just as an example, like I'm yelling at her. At, at, and then when I'm in the moment, I'm like, oh, wait, I, I want to stop this. So then I'll I bring myself back, you know, and whatever it is, like if it's anxiety, like, OK, OK, wait. Okay, I understand that this is the exact moment that I've been working on getting over. Okay, let me just... And then the next time, it's not going to be as bad. You're going to notice it earlier, and you're going to let go of it earlier. And you keep doing that until you clear that karmic cycle, and then it's gone because you dealt with it in the right way. Perfectly said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right, so how about we make another, we'll, we banged a hard left in the beginning, now let's bang a hard right into farming life. Farming life from the city. Let's keep driving. <laughs> uh, how, the, how's the, how was the transition? How is the transition? You've been there for like six months or so now. Uh, so how, you know, how'd it go from, what was it, Jersey City to now a farm? What's that like? Correct. Um, yeah, I, I arrived here in February of uh, of this year. Um, I'll tell you, you know, we keep talking about making hard left turns, hard right turns in this conversation. And that journey was, it wasn't a turn. It was just like a, just a head-on collision and then going backwards at the same exact speed. It was uh, quite a head turner, but in the most dramatic beautiful way it could have possibly turned out um i i grew up in the city my whole life i was a new yorker born and raised in the last probably i'll say five years i was living in jersey city with my wife and um hmm. you know we had at, at a certain point in our relationship uh we were no longer serving each other and it became difficult and untenable and we tried to work on it on all the normal routes you would go, like therapy and things like that. Um, but it was just becoming untenable. And then spring of 2020 hit, and all of a sudden all my work kind of evaporates. So we were in this tumultuous moment in our relationship. The world is in this tumultuous moment, and we decide we're like, hey, we're just going to drive across the country for four months. So we hopped in our car with our two dogs and we drove and I did a lot of soul searching and I was thinking going along all the normal routes like, Oh, do I want to go back for law? Oh, do I want to be a doctor? Do I want to be an electrical engineer, technician of some sort? And then just the intuition hit me for farming. Um, previous to this, I'd suffered with arthritis about when I was 30 and, um, the way I fixed my health was through, animal foods i don't know if you get hip to the carnivore diet stuff have you uh no i haven't looked into it but uh, i i do know that it does help some people you know the people that cr really rave about it yeah and i i bring it up pointedly like that because you know in this 
in the circles of spirituality and self growth, there's a lot of people who go on the vegetarian vegan path. And I don't, I think everyone should be able to make the food choices that they eat. And I think that's a great choice for me. It was eliminating all of those foods and going back to animal foods. Um, but I digress. So that's what got me in, interested in farming. And when we got back from the road trip in November, um, we ultimately decided that, yeah, that we weren't truly serving each other in this relationship and we split right when we got back. Mm. So it was uh, one of the diff most difficult things I've ever had to do in one of the most challenging times in modern history. <laughs> was um, it a rough road trip? No, it was smooth. We're okay. still very friendly. We talk all the time. Um, oh, that's cool. just in, yeah, it, it was a very amicable and beautiful separation if you could describe it that way, but um yeah, there's no hurt feelings anywhere. Um and when I got back, I was I kind of just I felt like I was in the air floating, so I started um, applying to different farms to do internships, and I applied to this farm called White Oak Pastures in southern Georgia. It's 3,000 acres, 300 employees, all grass-fed, organic livestock. We really grow earth and grass, but livestock just live on it, and we tend to them 24-7. Um, so... Yeah, I, I applied around Christmas time, and then I got a call in February, supposed to start in February. I got a call end of January saying that I didn't get accepted. So that was disappointing, and I was urged to reapply, so I reapplied. And then probably a week before the start date of the internship, I got a call from the coordinator said, hey, we had someone drop out. Do you want to do it? So I dropped everything I had, and it was just a wonderful thing. And up until that point, I had been meditating every single day and journaling every single day and trying to move through the pain that had been occurring in my life and trying to trying to transmute it this whole idea of transmutation lately has i'm coming to realize that everything is transmutation there, there's everything's a tool everything's a test everything's a transmutation so taking that taking that fear, that sadness, that perceived loss and changing it into something that is uh positive was my goal and it, and it, and it happened and, and now I'm here and after about 2 months of my internship they asked me if I wanted to work full time and I gladly accepted so now I live on this farm and I'm I'm just happy as can be. Well, wow, that's amazing. So you farm animals uh do, what animals do you tend to so on this farm we have um cattle sheep goats uh pigs chicken turkey guinea fowl um probably have some others that i'm forgetting rabbit um i work in the sheep and goat department so i'm uh learning to become a shepherd which is really cool oh wow That's yeah. very uh symbolic yes is extremely symbolic um yeah and so how old are you because you said uh uh earlier you mentioned when you were 30 to, uh you were doing i forget exactly what you mentioned but how old are you now 36 okay i i thought so i just you know I, sometimes my brain just uh has a brain fart you know <laughs> i'm familiar <laughs> um so so you're 35 years you live in the city doing music, you know, city lifestyle. And now six months you're in the rural, you're on a farm, you're in a rural area and you went through the most painful thing that you've went through in your life just last year. And you just said, now you're as happy as can be living on a farm, doing something so foreign to anything you ever knew how does that feel for you to uh, be absorbing this at the, where do you think that you were living your life in the incorrect way before or that that was all leading to this it was definitely all leading to this you know my life before i had i was dead set 
on the way I was living my life before. I always wanted to live my life through being a musician. I, that's what I've always wanted, and I, and I feel like I've achieved it. And <clears throat> at a certain point many years ago, I felt like maybe, I don't, I don't know how to put this in the right terms, like maybe the, um, the edge of it, the purpose behind it, was fulfilled and it was maybe changing and maybe I needed to kind of close that chapter. I'd been feeling it for a little while and it manifested as things like me not enjoying listening to or playing music as much as I previously had been. And I sensed it. I knew it. But the matrix version of myself in the simulation was going, no, you're, this is what you built, this is what you are, this is what you do, you stay here and you keep going until you retire and die or something like that. Um, and that is not how to stay on the path. I mean, I don't want to speak for anyone, but that's not how I wanted to stay on my path. So I feel like it was God just kind of like going like, yoink, <laughs> hey buddy, uh, I'm going to put you on a new path for a minute and you're going to possibly see there's another purpose for you, and go check this out. And when I got here, I really felt like a plane just with a smooth landing. That's how I felt inside. Like it was just, ah, like home, we're safe, we landed. And, yeah, there's some growing pains and culture shock, like coming from the north, going to the south. Um, you know, music is a very physical thing. Like it's kind of a gig world. You're working with your hands. So I, I'm used to physical labor i'm used to grunty stuff you know what i mean um it's not i'm not saying music is not as uh glitzy and glamorous as it may appear on the surface there are those moments for sure um but it felt like home coming here um and i felt like i had this renewed sense of purpose and edge like this razor sharp edge something to grow into uh, something to learn something that was exciting and um something that just resonated more deeply with me. I really wanted to get back to nature, and I mm. knew I wanted to. I just didn't know how I was going to do it. I didn't know if I had the courage to do it, so I stayed. I stayed in the city. I stayed on my previous path, and then, uh, you know, God comes down and... Plucks just, you out. Just plucks you out. <laughs> plucks yeah. You out. Uh, yeah, and I do want to talk about moving from the north to the south, and Mimi, uh, she's also from... Delco, you know, right outside Philly, where I'm from, you know, so the three of us are all from the Northeast. Mimi's been here for 20 years, or at least in the South plus, for 20 years, yeah. Yeah, 20 plus. Uh, but, you know, I'm just from July and last July, and you're in February. So, you know, I, I do want to get into that for a moment, but uh, or in a moment, but what you were just saying about feeling like you're home, that is exactly how I felt. Uh, when I got here, when I took my vacation here last July, I, I talk about it many times, is that I was like, oh, I I'm home. You know, it was similar to when I first did DMT, because when you first do DMT, you're like, oh, I've been here before. Oh, I'm back. And then it's like, oh, fuck. Now, I remember now. And, and you just have a brief, <laughs> brief memory, and you have the feeling of, being welcomed in what seemed like a foreign land. And, you know, for me coming here, I, three weeks later, I completely moved. You know, I, me and my daughter, we came back and, and we moved all of our stuff and I left most, most of my stuff and I spent, uh, you know, a several thousand dollars in order to move down here. And, you know, I was like, I have no job prospect, COVID's happening you know, all this different stuff's going, but I was like, this is what I need to do. And, you know, just like with you, God plucked me and, and put me here. And I do want to talk about the difference in attitude. Well, see, coming from a musician standpoint, you might have been dealing with people who weren't, who were a little more chill than what I was dealing with. And I don't want to assume anything, but when... I'm filling uh, vending machines for people. You know, they treat you like you're scum. And I made really good, I made better money than anybody that I ever dealt with. Any of my clients, like I was making over $1,000 a week easy. Uh, sometimes it'd be like 1400 in a week. And it's like, 
like you guys are talking to me, trying to talk to me like I'm so, you know like I'm doing better than you guys are at your own game and, and just doing something super simple uh so the way that I that I see the people in the city particularly but the north especially is that everyone's so busy they can't be bothered to wait because you know when you're on the highway that you can never really go fast because there's always a ton of cars there uh you, when you go to a store you can never be the first one in line because there's a ton of people and it's very stressful being in that type of environment so then i moved down here and everything is a half hour away 20 minutes away 15 minutes away you know everything is is pretty far not pretty far but it's 15 miles you know it's not just 15 minutes it's 15 miles so it seems intimidating but then i'm like well it would take me 15 minutes to go two miles when i lived at home you know it would take me 20 minutes to go that three and a half miles from my house to the the walmart and now walmart's 20 miles away takes me 20 minutes same amount of time and it's completely stress-free. I'm just doing 60, 70 on the highway. And there's, like, never any cars around. And being a truck driver, I'm not dealing with traffic. When I go to a store, because I'm in a better mood, then I'm not stressed out that, I, oh, okay, maybe i got to stand in line. You know, maybe I'll have a little bit of traffic here. It's not stressful like it is when it's nonstop. It's just like, oh, it's always, like, pounding you, like, too many people are living in one area and it's like it does something to everybody and when you come down here it's like so relieving i don't know if that's your experience but the, just the the general patience and niceness and kindness yeah it's much more chill and relaxed and slow slower yeah, slow yeah mm -hmm. yeah so how do you feel uh in in that sense I would agree with all of that. You know, in the city, there's the hurry up and wait mentality, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, there's a traffic jam on the highway. A tiny bit of sp tiny spot opens up and someone's right in front to a dead stop. And, um, yeah, so that is a breath of fresh air coming down here and just to have all this space. Um, and then there's the flip side of the coin. There's the balance, right? So, in, I guess you... You know, being a musician, there's that dark side of music where you need the muse, right? And a lot of the, a lot of people's talents and energy, you know, you can get it from, I guess, I, I want to put it this way, the light side or the dark side. And a lot of people are doing the drugs, the drinking, the bar scene, the sex, all that stuff, right? Um, so there's, there's that part of the city that, and an overindulgence in it is common, and that's where a lot of talent seems to spring from, fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know. Um, but there's, up here, you're free from a lot of that type of stuff, but it still exists in another form, um, maybe a little bit more underground. Um, there's, there's still drugs, there's still alcohol, um, but there's less of a scene that if you wanted to you know, perhaps meet others. You have a, a smaller pool of people to do that. So that's the flip side. You know, you you don't you don't get a lot of that that you'd be able to access in the city. But my my body, my whole being was telling me I didn't need that anymore. Like I'd gone past it. Like it it wasn't serving me. Um, and I, like I said, I feel much more at home, much more relaxed here. Um, have a lot more opportunity to think and and meditate and have space to grow into here whereas in the city there's this constriction that i felt um even though it was balanced out with all these available toys and fun la la land stuff that every city brings but I f it feels real here it feels like real life yeah i feel the exact same way the expansion of you know that's what i was telling people uh right when i moved i was like you know i stopped growing there I needed to. I needed growth, and I needed to come here. How about you, Mimi? Did you feel that? Well, when under I different first got circumstances. Here, well, it was so long ago. Um, I just know it was the best move I ever made. <laughs> um, Me too. Yeah. 
Yeah. It, at first, it was definitely a little culture shock, but uh, Georgia has definitely grown on me over the years. Yeah, yeah I feel like it kind of, you know, uh, Philly would beat you into submission. I feel like Georgia beat me into submission of being nice, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and relaxing. Yes, it does. Uh, they Georgia massaged does, you into submission. Yeah, it's massage. put some manners into you real quick. <laughs> yeah. And uh, speaking of Philly, uh, I before I started full time here, I went back down to New Jersey to kind of pack up house. And I stopped on the way back in Philly to stay with uh, my friend Abby, Manish, and Boris. So I stayed with them and we took some mushrooms and we got a whole big walking tour of Philly and looked at all the Tartarian architecture that exists there oh, and wow. time traveling Ben Franklin and all that. And the whole time, the whole time we were there, Abby was having a realization like, I have to leave here like I have to leave because yeah, they came and spent time with me down here in, in Bluffton Georgia and when I got there it was just clear like it, it's suffocating it's absolutely suffocating well, you know uh Juliet Root and Mackie Root from the Woo cast no oh yeah you should check them out they're pretty good uh they, they left down. yeah they left Philly and went to uh Colorado somewhere in Colorado but they just left Philly and it, you know I I I found uh Vera Shanti you know, from uh etheric surgery 101 she's from Philly and now she just moved to Florida a, a few weeks ago I think uh, but you know it was so funny how I connected with her I was listening to their podcast and she was on there and she was talking about etheric surgery and I'm like wait nobody knows about etheric surgery and, and I always have etheric surgery on me so I'm like let me find out what this is and when I talked to her my my abilities just shot through the roof she was like some like 13th dimensional like mother being of like if there's 7.8 billion people, she's like the mother of like 5 billion of them. Like I can wow. just, she's just super intense. Yeah. I have to get hip to that. What was the show you said? Etheric? Etheric Surgery 101. Uh, oh, that was just my episode 21. Oh, oh, okay. When you had her on. Yeah. 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 But that other one, uh, WooCast with Juliet Root and Mackie Root, that's where I found her at, at you know. Yeah. I got you. Um, yeah, so, you know, you know it's know. funny. You... Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to think, like, I was listening to your uh, Andrea Zertis episode and talking about, like, the reset and orphans, and I just keep speculating, like, what if all of this that we're seeing right now is an effort to just shake the game board and just make people move? Like, instead of doing it on orphan trains and forcing people to move, like, what if we just do this and make people Hmm. That's interesting. That's an interesting Just idea. A speculation. I, I think it's kind of God making people move. Well, if the goal was to get them out of the city, it's working. Yeah. Well, and uh, and I mean, yeah. there are, there are <laughs> things you can point to and evidences that you can say, oh, they wanted to scare people out so that they could buy up all the property cheap and then sell it back to people. You know, make it a smart city and then bring everyone back, but. You know, I don't think it's going to end up going that way. I think we have veered off course of their their t agenda 2030. I think a lot more We've people taken are a hard left fa farming and gardening and taking care of our damn selves. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like this food. Uh, uh, you guys haven't even heard this yet, but uh, you talked to Jim Gale from Food Forest Abundance uh, mm. the other day, and man... I can't wait. I, yeah, we, we're getting a food forest uh, soon. Uh, it's We're so excited. We already got the chips on the way. Well, not on the way, but we have them ordered uh, to whenever they get here. But, you know, it's super exciting. Everyone's doing it. Hop on to the new earth. It's coming. Mm -hmm. We're building it. Yeah, yeah, we are. That's I, right. If you can't do it, if you can do it, or if somebody else can't do it for you, you do it for yourself. That's yep. right. And sticking with the theme of the show, you know, let's make a hard U-turn back to Tartaria, what you were just saying, because you sent me, and this is just a, like an extension of Tartaria, 
but it goes with it. Uh, you sent me a video about timeline deception and how, you know, the timeline isn't the way that it's presented to us. And I very much agree. And I, I like, I watched several of that, uh, that woman's videos and she shows you different things. Very interesting stuff. It's all very appealing to me. Uh, and I was listening to a, a couple people today, uh, like back to back episodes on the deep share podcast he had on different people talking about these types of things, uh, uh alternate timeline or uh, I mean, uh, alternate, uh, yeah, timelines, basically a uh, history of Earth and the star forts and, and things of this nature. So listen to all this. You know, it pops in my head. What? Why is there all that predictive programming about the post-apocalyptic world of Mad Max, the Mad Max scenario? What if there was a mud flood that uh, eventually, you know, if it's not raining in a place any longer, the mud could turn into sand. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe, but it, maybe it turns into sand dunes. You know, that type of the way that the world is depicted in uh, in the Mad Max movies and in that movie with um, with Denzel Washington when he's blind. I forget what it is. Or is that Jamie Foxx? Oh, man, I forget what the movie is. It's a really good movie when he's blind and, and he kicks everybody's ass and nobody knows he's blind. I forget what it is. But it, these are post-apocalyptic Mad Max worlds. So then I just get the intuitive thought, you know, it's not that nothing happened in the thousand years. Like, we're told Jesus is 2,000 years ago, right? And what the timeline deception is saying is now that it's more like 1000 years ago, that this last 1000 years is all bullshit, which I agree that the not what the information they tell us is bullshit. But I think the amount of time is still correct. But that what happened there was actually a Mad Max post apocalyptic world from the mud floods and that everybody was just running rampant in the world, and they're doing whatever. You know, factions live here, they live there, they and they go out, and there's nothing. You can't do anything because everything's covered in sand uh, in this area. So what happens is a group of people who worship Christ get together, and they come up with their own ideas, and they be they create the Jesuits, the Knights of the Templar, the Freemasons, and they go around murdering people in the name of Christ because they think that that's what they're supposed to do. They're murdering people and covering up all of that history and saying, no, that never existed, and it was just, oh, it kept happening this way. And instead of telling us about Tartaria, they're like, oh, no, we got to get rid of that, all that stuff, and we'll call that Roman. And so what ends up happening is that the truth is is actually just a post-apocalyptic universe world and they didn't want us to know about it so they went around killing these people who were warmongers who were you know savages and that they that the freemasons were holding everything in place for us to finally show them that we're not going to be warring people any longer you know that's the thought that came to me today and it was like a whole series of between visions and thoughts that are coming to me and that's what I call telepathic communication all this stuff's coming to me all of a sudden it's like whoa you know that's a that's an out there idea but it, it kind of fits that's interesting so if I get that straight you're saying the Freemasons are actually protecting the infrastructure they think, well, okay, so that they decided uh, that, that, you know, this is how they sold it to each other in order for them to commit murders and, 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 and be godly. In the name of God, they're doing this. They think that they're doing this in the name of God. So this is why 
because they are the hidden hand. They are those who are responsible for, I mean, if you watch any of Dave J, his stuff with uh, the pyramids in Mexico being, you know, on the backside is brick. You know, it's not real. The, the Freemasons just, they build up these fake structures to say, oh no, look, this is how things kept going. So they wanted to cover up this post-apocalyptic world. And so that's, they were killing killers but you know it's not their place to actually do that so they just ended up taking over that that makes perfect sense especially in light of the woman's video i wish i can give her credit and remember her name but um yeah, in terms exploring of tartaria is the youtube page i don't know her name though yes exploring tartaria like she talks about the concept of like i think she calls it preterism but what if every prophecy that you would read in the Bible is actually most of them have occurred already. And what if, um, you know, after the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, like that the fall of Rome was the Inquisition and they just kind of stretched it all out and spread out stories all over the world. But it was the fall of Rome and it was instant and it was Mad Max and it all happened at once very quickly. Yeah, that, I I agree with that, and it's very interesting that she posits the thought that Jesus Christ was an actual king for a thousand years. He was a man that lived for a thousand years, and there's all these different kings all over the place that, with these different names that looked just like him, depicted to look just like him, and and it, it's very interesting. And even she's saying Catholicism is actually the merging of church and state as in, you know, it's no longer divided, as, there, you know, Christianity is supposed to be about the spirit, and, you know, it's it's kind of the merging of, no, this was the literal events, like, this wasn't a, a spiritual thing, this was an actual thing that happened, and that's what the difference between Catholicism and Christianity is, or how it started, in her opinion, is that, you know, the the Catholics are like, no, we're talking about things that actually happen. The Christians are like, yeah, so are we, but they're talking about the spiritual stuff that actually happened, where the Catholics are like, no, you know, we're talking about the 3D things, physical things that happen. So it's very interesting because, you know, what would they do? You know, the the they, what would they do? They would pervert and invert everything from Catholicism. They That's the last place you think the truth would be because it's run by all these pedophiles, you know, the Catholic Church is known for it for many years, many cover-ups, you know, Catholicism is not a popular thing these days, uh, and there's not too many people who are very proud to be Catholic at this moment, because the Catholic Church, the leadership, honestly, has done a very poor job at being holy people, and have done the most perverted and disgusting things you can do on earth. So, you know, with that being said, that's exactly what someone would do if they wanted to cover up the truth. They would make that organization so disgusting that you can't possibly think that they could be good. It's pretty mind-blowing. Yeah, that that's what's going on, you know. Um, what does Sam Tripoli always say? Like, conspiracy will lead you to spirituality, right? right. That's learning how... Learning the deception on the deception on the deception kind of just cracks you open at some point and you say, wait a minute, something grander is going on here. Um, and yeah, I think one of the videos I watched recently that kind of, I couldn't talk for like a week after watching it because it all put it all together for me. Was like, Did you see the At Altean Childs one, the world's secret religion? No, no, I haven't. You yeah, have I guess to send me that one. as well. It, it, I, I'm sure you know all of it, but this is I, when I watched it. It was before I put all those things together with uh, masonry and with the uh, religion and the pedophilia and the Luciferianism, and how it's all pervasive from the top down, from the Vatican to all your entertainment to the banking system. It's literally all one giant cabal of deception. And yep. then, um, you know, when, when I realized that, I was like, all right, I can go either two ways here. I can just get really down on it and just be super cynical about it, or it'll take me 
to another place if I just keep following these little synchronistic breadcrumbs I'm getting and it took me to a place of like, oh, there's actually something good going on, something greater, not, you know, we're defeating, we're going to win, essentially. Right. right. Hey, I, I'll tell you what, I, I had this strange thought. Have you ever heard of the Carrington event? I've heard of it, but I can't describe it for you. Okay, so 1859 Carrington event was the last major sun event that if it happened today, it was a CMA, essentially, a solar flare. And mm -hmm. if it happened today, it would knock out our infrastructure, what we have what, in place now. What do they call that, a year without a sun or a summer or something like that? Well, that was 1812. That was, oh, okay. that was from a volcano, which... Yeah, it, there was a year without the summer, and we know volcanoes, they cause mud floods by soil liquefaction, and the mud swallows up whatever's on the land, and then it hardens, and you have to actually dig it out uh, in order to, you know, you can't just pull on it. It's not, you know, it's quicksand, but mud. Uh, yeah, so, so that was 1812, but I think that it all, there was something that, started off in 1812 and i think it kind of uh, was cemented in place in 1859 with the carrington event so since the carrington event our electromagnetic uh, defense for the earth the, the electromagnetic field that it has to protect from the sun has dropped by like 30 percent and it was like it, it didn't move at all until the Carrington event, and then since then, you know, from 1859 to like 2000, it dropped like 10 percent, or maybe it was like 15 percent. But then from 2000 to like 2010 was like another 10 percent, and then, then it was like another five or 10 percent from 2010 to 2017, and then they stopped keeping track because it was it's, you know, just dropping at such an uh, alarming rate. But, you know, Lucifer, the bringer of light, the one who came down and showed the light, what if the Carrington event was that? What if the Carrington event was Satan entering the earth, having a short time to live on earth? Right. And this is what she gets to in that video is that right. uh, Satan will be loosed a short season after being cast down to hell. And not only... I realized it viscerally on a, a knowing level, like a, a level that I felt in my bones. Like, I felt like I won the game one moment. I just realized, like, oh, yeah, everything, like, is a, we're living in this weird hell matrix, and I feel like I finally figured out and I escaped. Like, I knew, I knew what everything was, um, and that's what brought about this weird little synchromistic journey I've had that brought me the idea of God. I, n I never grew up religious. Um, and then I started watching more and more into this, and then I started checking out Flat Earth stuff, because even I was like, oh, Flat Earth thing is a whole psyop thing, and I start watching it. And Oh, no, but even before that, I started watching um, Wilhelm Reich stuff about etheric energy, and they were talking about scarab beetles and how they might actually harness ether rather than fly with their wings. So now my mind is primed for scarab beetles. And then I'm watching these flat earth videos and there's a scarab beetle that flies and bonk and bumps me in the arm and just kind of lands on the porch next to me. And it was a video talking about the possibility of a creator, excuse me, a creator and, you know, all of that stuff. And the, the scarab was primed in my mind, so that thing gave me a little signal, and it stayed there as I was watching this video. So, oh, let me, yeah, so that kind of brought about the idea of God for me, and I was bringing it into my meditation and into my journaling and speaking about God. And then I listened to your podcast, and you, we did the meditation, and you introduced me to the Jesus is King album. And this was before I did the meditation, actually. I just listened to the album. You told me about the album, and being a musician and an obsessive type of person, I got obsessed with the album, and I'm listening, and I'm listening, and I'm listening, and I'm listening, and I'm out on a Saturday, I think it's a Saturday or Sunday morning, no, evening, the sun's going down, and I'm mowing, and I'm mowing, and I'm listening to the uh, Kanye album, 
and he gets to the eighth song. It's called God Is, and he's listing all the things that he's grateful for, and he's just celebrating and sitting in this pocket of God, and I just, just tears came streaming down my face, and I had this amazing realization, like it's all God. God is 100% real. How did I not know about this? God is the reason all this is happening, and we have a purpose, and we're going to do it we are going to do it and i just pulled over the mower i got off and i got out from behind one of the solar panels that was shading me and i look up at the sun and i just see a big beautiful perfect setting sun and i'm just sitting here in, in perfect paradise and i'm just crying tears coming down my face like i was crying for five minutes and when i got home i saw a dead scarab beetle and i hadn't seen one since the last time it was dead like the ending of the cycle the death of the cycle ready to start anew. I've been following this little beetle wow. synchronicity around. Yeah. Wow. That all happened in the span of like a month. Wow. Yeah. So that's uh, about the time I reached out to you was the end of that cycle. That's amazing. Yeah. So how about that? And this is an end of a cycle for me. Uh, so this will be episode 39 and all of my episodes have been like in sets of 13, like the first 13 were me. Then the next 13 were, you know, me getting my feet on, on the ground. And now this 13 was the hero's journey. Uh, you know, it started with uh, the episode, the hero's journey with Justin Deschamps, who also lives in Georgia. You're like my, I think fourth or fifth guest from Georgia which wasn't even you know i didn't even know plan. yeah i didn't know any of them except for the the one guy i knew was in georgia but you know that just happens that way let uh, me freak but, your bean my birthday is may 13th well yeah. and, and today is friday the 13th whoa <laughs> <laughs> dude we've been having these synchronicities man i don't know uh yeah, yeah, man. And uh, let me bring it back to what we were just talking about. Do you know why Friday the 13th is uh, bad luck, you know, considered to be bad luck? Well, probably because it's a good thing and they're trying to invert it. Exactly. The Knights Templar were arrested and executed May 13th, 1307. May 13th? Is that what he just said? No, his um, was? Oh, was it May 13th? Well, he just said his birthday was May 13th. Hold on. I, yeah, yeah. Look that date up. <laughs> yeah, let me. That would be cool. That would be very interesting. Wait, where is this photo? <laughs> October. No, oh. wait. No. Okay, no. The, so the article <laughs> came out October 13th. <laughs> uh, so let's see. <laughs> wait, it's not in this. I'll have to go to the website real quick. Can you get it or you need me to do it while you talk? Uh, I can do it. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. It's all, it's all my Instagram. Isn't it? Is that where I got it from? I don't know. Yeah, go ahead. You pull it up. It's well, while you look that up, while, while you look that up, I, I'll tell about when we did our first meditation. I looked on your website um, to book your meditation, and your meditation costs $88. Mm -hmm. And I booked our meditation on August 8th at 8 p.m. Um, it's an auspicious alignment. Okay, so this just said, yeah, oh, yeah, that was definitely uh, auspicious is, is definitely right. Uh, and I'll t get into it the 8th in October. a second. I'm going to say October 13th, 1307. Does it always be Friday the 13th, 1307? Well, I guess we'd have to go back on a calendar to look, but whatever. It was Friday the 13th. Mm -hmm. what, what is the night the Templar were arrested and executed. Uh, so that's why the, it's called bad luck, you know. That's what it's all about. Bad luck for I, them. I guess it's Jason, you know, why Friday the 13th, why he has all the victims, you know, Jason Voorhees. There's probably something to it. If I read that article, I'm sure I could come Definitely. up with some stuff. Absolutely. But, um, the the eights, it's funny that day came Michael Wan's River Magic was released that day. And I released that, like you said, it was on eight eight and I released that at eight oh eight AM. And so that's four eights right there. And the 
title of the episode is number 32, Michael Wan River Magic. 32 is four eights. So if you take the four eights from that and the four eights from the date and time, then you have eight eights. So you have infinite infinites on the show titled River Magic. And then, then you and I meditated. We started meditating at 8.08 p.m. I don't know if you noticed, but that was, it was, we had a conversation. We got on at 7.30 we, and we talked for a little while. And then, you know, I think it was like 8.03, we started, you know, going over the groundwork of what's going to go on. And then it was 8.08 is when we started. And I swear on anything, I didn't plan it that way. It just happened that way. That was the beginning of the infinite that day. The infinite infinites. You know, it's uh, it's all the possibilities. And then the next day when I talked to uh, the Food Forest Abundance, it was just, the guy from Food Forest Abundance, it was just like, oh my God, am I, you know, am I about to like do something like so dramatically different from what I was like two years ago, like what's going to ha be, happen to me in two years from now, you know, after all this different stuff and just all the different possibilities. Then the next day after I talked to him, you know, after I talked to you and, and worked with you and after I talked to him, it was just like my mind was so high vibing with all this. And then the next day, the Miguel Connor episode comes out, episode 33, of course, and Miguel Connor, you know, being a Gnostic and what we talk about Jesus in that episode. Then the next day, my episode on conspiracy gets released. And then the next day I released the episode with Andreas Exertus and it's, you know, talking about Tartaria, which you sent me a video of, you know, and it's all just comes full circle and it's all just aligning. Everything is just orchestrated. Al yes. Mm -hmm. It's all aligning. And, uh, I think Brandon, he, he gave me a great saying that the closer you get to home, the more you recognize. So, you know, that's what synchronicities are. We're recognizing more and more because we're getting closer and closer to being home, whatever, you know, whatever that is. Whatever that is. Heaven on earth, maybe. Yeah. New heaven, new I earth. I think so. And, and speaking of Brandon's episode, that one was really powerful in particular for me. Because you were just talking about options and possibilities and maybe doing something so different and like this this torrential kind of hurricane of ideas and possibilities. And what I like to be in that state 50% of the time and that allows me to follow the mysteries of what's happening around me. But the other 50% of the time, I like to be doing something that's, like you say, more grounded. And Brandon's episode was very practical and mm -hmm. after hearing it i wrote out my manifesto called the danifesto <laughs> and the danifesto is is the very general plan of intention for the direction of my life so it doesn't tell i don't dictate the form it's going to come in i just dictate the intentions behind different aspects of my life and the way i want to see so i have the danifesto and then inspired by Todd Armstrong and Brandon Beecham. And then I have a prayer that I read before it. And then I have um, like a, an abundance statement uh, just for pure manifestation purposes. And then I have different areas of my life. I have, um, and I list them in order of importance. And number one is spiritual growth. And I write down in general what that looks like. Not any, it doesn't say I have to meditate for 30 minutes every day. It just talks about the purity of my intention and how I intend to grow. And then my next one down will be my land and my home. And it doesn't say how many acres it's going to be. It talks about how I'm going to treat the land and how I'm going to value the land and how important the land is going to be to everyone around me and how I'm going to serve it. And it's going to serve everyone. And then I have my relationships and then friends and family and things like that. I have the whole Danifesto and I read it. And Brandon, it was inspired by you and, and Brandon's conversation. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. You know, that's very, I feel so wonderful that I could bring that to you or help bring it to you because Brandon, he helped, you know, unlock the abundance in me as I started the, the 
conversation or not started, but when we were early on, it was his episode that really unlocked that feeling in me that I, of unworthiness that I wasn't worthy of profiting for doing this and it was he really helped me get the ball rolling with that so for you to tell me it really helped you and you know to say that I inspired you you know that it's just such a wonderful feeling thank you so much for saying all that and hey if you ever want to share it with me you know I'd, I'd be happy to read it I'm happy to. I'm still doing tweaks on it. Right, well, I'm working on uh, some projects too on the website, and I'm uh, I'm building a member section, and I'm going to try to get some kind of little chat forum going in there. I have to figure that out. It was a little more difficult to navigate than I expected, but I'm sure I can figure it out. Would uh, you want to start a Telegram channel? Uh, see, I was thinking about. Well, I I don't actually because I don't want to be on more social media. I want to do all my stuff on the website and then just shove that out to the social media, which maybe I I will be a part of Telegram at some point. I just I'm not really into it at the moment, but I'm working on. I have a section called uh, projects. So what I'm doing is right now I'm making a presentation for the Book of Enoch. And it, it's I would love that. Oh um, man, it's, it's going to be good. I got it's, you know, I've only did it for like three hours or so. I got like thirty-seven slides done, and I'm only fifteen chapters in. A ton in. of work done. A ton. I'm a third of the way through it. Uh, uh, yeah, I've read it several times, and I've listened to it. I'll send you the link to listen to it because uh, it's a dramatic reading, and it's really good. It's four hours long. Sweet. Yeah. So. Uh, it, it's so much information to take in that now that I'm doing, I'm breaking it down the way that I am to make the slides, I'm seeing even more than I've ever seen with it before. And the more that I read it and uh, the more that I'm listening to it, my third eye's working and I'm seeing things and I'm, and I'm picking up different things and I'm putting it together in such a, a, a great way. But what I'm getting at with that is that I have these projects that I'm going to be putting on there, you know, like unfinished projects of, you know, this is what I'm working on and, and people will be able to take a look at it. And, uh, you know, maybe if someone has some information that can benefit any of the members can, you know, let me know like, Hey, this is wrong. You know, this, this is actually right. Or, you know, just whatever can, can, contributions anyone wants to make you know I, I i advertise on there if you sign up for the membership that you'll get uh, beh access to behind the scenes opportunities which might be you know doing things like this like i want to do this in a way that i want people who want to do different things you know i i, I want to guide as best I can, I want to guide the universe into going to a certain place. And anyone who wants to be on that ride with me, you know, I I want everybody. So, you know, I if anyone signs up for the membership, it's uh, it'll be ten bucks to be a member, but you get ten percent off for life for any of the services. You get uh, behind the scenes access, like I said, opportunities and. Who knows what that may entail six months from now, a year from now, you know, who knows what kind of opportunities that's going to roll into. And, uh, you know, and you'll be up to date on everything that's going on, uh, you know, best best I can. I'm trying to get out there a little bit more in, in the public and doing projects like this. Like, I never even thought about doing a presentation before. I don't want to say who the podcasters are, but someone's going to have me on their show when they ask me if I have a video presentation. And I was like, no, I have my memory. You know, I have notes, and I have my memory, and I have the book with me. And they are like, oh, okay. And then I was like, you know what? We set it up to be in September, and I was like, i got a couple weeks. You know, I'll put together a video presentation. Watch. And now here we are. <laughs> I like the idea of um, 
you know, working with an unfinished product because, you know, the perf- they say the perfect is the enemy of the good. Mm-hmm. And also, like, our work is never going to be completed. So if we're waiting for that final feeling, just forget about it. So I, I really like the idea of, of putting half-baked material out there and using it as an opportunity to, like, call on people for for their viewpoints or just maybe just enjoy it as it is for now. And Yeah, yeah, because, uh, you know, I do want it to be out there, but I do want it to be finished when I put it out to the public. But when, you know, just to my, whoever's in the membership, you know, all right, you guys, you know, want to see what I'm working on now? Uh, because sometimes intuition comes to me in the form of i'll do two blogs in a day like the one day i did time and water and you know they're the the one about time is long and the one about water is not as long but it's still kind of long and to type all those up in in one night you know that kind of burns me out so you know it's just intuition comes to me in waves and now my intuition is oh do presentations you know so Whatever I'm working on at the time, whether it's uh, I'm going to be writing a book here soon, you know, I don't know exactly what it's going to be yet because it's still being written in my mind. But, you know, all those types of things, I can't wait to uh, to get that off the ground, you know, so to speak, uh, on the website to get that members access area up and running. Um, piece by piece. Yeah. Yes, definitely. For uh definitely have to do it it's a, definitely a puzzle and you know there's we're in the middle pieces now i feel like you know the edges for me are all put together and they're pretty clear and now it's the middles getting there and you know that's actually a pretty good sw- segue into no it's not but it sticks with the theme of the show is you know microdosing okay and we're going to talk <laughs> about microdosing and then how we have to fill in these little pieces by incorporating in our daily lives things that we don't typically see and how can we see things in a new way is you know sometimes you need a little assistance and i like to microdose uh i have uh, i will say not currently but i have microdosed shrooms and thc edible thc and they are both very, very helpful to me. Uh, are you into microdosing at all? Have you ever done it? Uh, and if you have, what w- did you use? I am a fan of microdosing. I've done it. Uh, I, I've had a few larger doses in my life, and I've had sometimes when I accepted the medicine and sometimes when i tried to refuse the medicine aka good trip bad trip um but i think it's an all-around game-changing medicine and at a certain point i was hearing about microdosing and i decided to try it i bought bought a whole bunch and i put them into little pills and uh, it, the pills are great because you're able to travel around with them like you could take them take them in your little toiletry bag the little and travel gel caps yeah, the little gelatin caps, and you press it with a manual presser. And um, I I think it's a, a double-edged sword, like anything else. There's a lot, if you're using them at the right pace for yourself and the right dosage with the right intent, you can really crack open the veil and feel a little bit more at one with everything around you like you truly are. It can crack that veil open and just let you sit in the oneness um and then the flip side of that is you can sometimes you can take too much um i've taken too much at times or maybe too often and felt a bit frazzled and off kilter and ungrounded so um i think it's a very good medicine in the proper dosage in the right hands in the right environment at the right time Um, Uh, i haven't i haven't had them in a while but I'm, i'm ready to have a batch and um I'm going to start incorporating them into my meditation days once in a while. And also, I also like to share them, like people who are interested and have never tried. It's such an easy way to get people introduced. You know, they take one and they're like, I didn't feel anything. All right, try two. Oh, I felt a little something. You know, it's, it's very benign. Uh, what's your regimen? Do you have a, a routine that you were going by? 
I was, yeah. There's a, I think there was a a study going online, like a, I want to say Johns Hopkins research thing about you would self-report, but the way they gave it to you was you take a microdose in the morning, um, and then you have two days off. One day off is like a recovery day. The second day off is like a clearing day, and then you do it again. Um, so I would do it in that, and I, I really like that rhythm. Um, I would take between 0.1 and 0.2 grams and be good. Once you get into 0.3 territory, now you're like a bit a off much. into another world. Right, and, much, and yeah. I heard someone on the podcast the other day, they said, oh, it used to act like caffeine for me when I first started, and I would take it in the morning, but now that I take it, you know, I just fall asleep, and, you know, it's probably because he was taking too much then, and he's taking too much now. <laughs> It shouldn't have that effect. Absolutely, on you. it should not have that effect. You're taking too much. You're taking a dose that's actually affecting your right. He's getting hot. Observable reality. It should be subtle. Yeah. 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 It shouldn't really be anything other than I'm very sensitive, so I can feel the point one when it hits my stomach. I can feel it, and I'm like, okay, energy mm -hmm. shift, just a little, but I feel it, the energy shift, but. Yeah, you have to definitely be careful and not do too much. You also have to be, like you said, you're sensitive and you can feel it. You have to have a sensitivity to know what's going on. Um, and I think that's what could be, be that was what's beneficial for my life in taking like a larger dose early on, maybe when I wasn't ready, not in the right setting, um, just to kind of get rocked with it and it shakes up your world. And um, you kind of know what to expect. So when you have a little bit of it, you could feel it. Um, we actually just had a session with a bunch of friends here, um, for a lot of first-timers, and they had a very positive experience. Um, this was maybe, I want to say, two months ago. And they, they like it. Um, so the door's open for them to try more and grow in that regard. They're not scared of it. Okay. Yeah, uh, my favorite actually to uh, microdose with would be edible THC because, uh, and small amounts that, but the, the, there is a, a, a clear difference in that you will feel that no matter what, you know, unless you do something so tiny that it doesn't do anything. But our whole bodies are covered in an endocannabinoid system and I'm, I can make my own edibles, you know, just get it into the butter. And then from there, you can do whatever with the butter. You know, you can have small amounts, you can have large amounts. So if you ha keep about the same amount, if you keep doing a small amount, you know, after a few days, you're not going to feel it. It's going to just be, you know, you're going to feel the energy shift and then, then that that's it. So I like doing that one because it's, it's something you can do that's not going to alter you much, much different, but it does give you a little alteration, which, you know, it's, it's always a little fun time. Yeah. I always err on the side of micro because, right. um, I, I'm, I've been a sensitive person my whole life and, uh, you know, a little too much THC and I get really paranoid and it doesn't. Yeah. So you, you are actually like, it's Hey, not how about for CBD? And yeah. I, and I tried a little CBD, you know, I was I was using it a while back, but I I kind of laid off of it, and now I've been incorporating it into my morning meditations, and it really just kind of makes me relax, raises up my energy levels just a bit, and then uh, I do a little grounding thing before I meditate, um, maybe do some push-ups or something active to kind of get back into my body and then begin. Oh, nice, nice, nice. Uh, I'm glad that uh, that was an option for you that, because the cbd is really effective and for a while there for me i was smoking cbd i cut out thc completely and i was smoking cbd and it was getting me like i don't know the astral world must have been like so close to the physical world that just like smelling cbd you know it just whoop um you know i'm traveling astral traveling you know i'm hearing everybody's thoughts you know like i'll it, it's it's not like when i say that people will probably think like oh that sounds scary or that sounds crazy or something but it's it's just it's very odd in that like i'll be in a room of 10 people 
and three people will be co having a conversation on my right, and then I'll just hear their thought seconds before they think it, or uh, I mean seconds before they say it, and it's like I do it with all three of them, and then it's like, whoa, that's, you know, it's weird, but, uh, you know, how am I going to be able to say, like, oh, this person's going to say this, this person's going to say this, this person's going to say this, I don't have enough time, I'd have to, like, freeze time and be like, hey, audience, look over here, this is what's about to happen, but, you know, so I like it. It, I think it's a fun thing for me, but, you know, it does sound so outrageous and so far out there for somebody who's never experienced it, and I experience it, uh, I mean, I don't really have any control over that. It just happens when it happens, but I experience it so often. Well, I mean, these kind of psychic gifts that people have, they all manifest in different ways in different people, and... um you know, I, I can't speak for sure if I have those types of gifts or not, but I know how when using a medicine affects me, it's on a very personal level. It makes a marked difference, like especially like when you suggested maybe trying that in my meditation practice, I noticed a marked difference in my ability to just um, surrender and settle into my seat and just be relaxed first thing in the morning. Uh, it's a nice little change. Well, well, I'm glad that I could help you out, and, I, and I'm, I'm glad that there's so many different things that you're telling me have helped you, uh, whether it be you listening to conversations uh, on my podcast that I've had with other people, or you know the work that we did directly, or even just the, uh, you know, the instructions. Uh, you know, I call it instructions, but it's just like a recommendation of things you could do. Yeah, I like how you put it, recommendations. Um, yeah, I, I'm I'm finding it really valuable. Like what I what I initially sparked me about your show is you you're very approachable. It seems like I could relate to you. Like the stories you told, what you did, I was like, oh, man, this guy's just like me. Mm -hmm. Except he's got like this divine talent for psychic abilities, and and also like you you're you're very practical you're into the meditation aspect and that's was mirrored in me i'm very much practical i like doing that kind of spiritual work but you have such a different point of view on it and um yeah your your podcast has just been a great it's become my arguably my favorite podcast like you have such a great variety of people you get into the conspiracy stuff but you really stay on the spiritual which i think is where it all goes like we can't get bogged down in the minutia and the information and the news of life like we have to use it to ascend and all get better and raise up everyone around us like so you have that edge to your show which not a lot of people do like count them on one hand so wow well wow, that is a uh, pretty high praise thank you so much uh yeah i i definitely like being practical and uh, I'm very open about my psychic gifts because, you know, it's it's the more that I'm open about it, the, the stronger they become. And then I can, like, I can show them off to people. And it's not like I want praise or anything. I don't want anyone thinking, like, I'm some god or some, like, guru or something. I'm just some guy that uh, God has determined has should get some information to disperse to everybody else for whatever reason. And, uh, you know, right. uh, it, I guess kind of the name change is kind of more comforting for me in that, you know, I can allow myself to be the spiritual warrior that I want to be and, and be okay with, you know, I'm not getting the praise because it's not what my human name actually is. So, you know, and I am having... I had a, I didn't have to, but I signed an email saying Emmanuel Kingman, and I was like, uh, you know, it, it felt a little weird, but, you know, I guess I have to kind of transition into that. It's like your band name. Yeah, well, yeah, and you know, a lot of people do is change their names. Yeah, it's a, it's a embodiment of your work that's outside of yourself that stands alone. It's a new entity. Right. So just, you already did it. You might as well just sit in it. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that's just my next stage that I have to get over. So, you know, yeah. so you're definitely part to... of that helping me get through it. So, yeah, I love, and I love to see it in real time like every episode like you go one step further and i get to see it happen in real time and talk to you in real life like i go from listening to your show to being a guest on your show talking with you in real life and like i guess i see your transformation in real time as it's happening to me and to you well that's what it's all about the synchronicities and you know this is yeah why, why anyone that i'm having on uh you know anybody who's listening to this you know follow the synchronicities and you know it's you have to let the universe know you want things by setting you know you got to put your foot down and say i will not take any more of this when it's something bad and when it's something good you want to put your foot down and say yes i'm running to that give me that you have to do it with every a part of your being and part of the reason why I do it it's a 21 day it is a recommendation and uh, it's not you know everybody has the choice to do it or not but why 21 days is because you need to it takes 21 days to start a new habit that you have to do it for 21 days then it starts to form and then at the end of like six weeks I think then it, it, it will be a new habit. But you have to force yourself to do the same thing because every version of you, so every personal, or I mean, every emotion that you have has its own personality. You know, how you deal with something when you're angry, you will deal with that same exact thing, very different if you're happy, very different if you're sad. Okay, so... so 100% agreed. Yeah, so you have to realize that you don't know which version of you you are and at any given moment when you wake up in the morning you don't know what timeline you woke up on did i wake up on the timeline where you know uh, i did something bad yesterday did i wake up on the timeline where i'm going to heaven today you know you we don't know so you have to have these practices where you're doing the same thing over and over you have to put every aspect of you has to go towards uh, the the greater good so if you have 21 different emotions I, I don't know the number of emotions I'm just throwing it out there I know it's probably higher than that but if you have 21 different emotions so you have 21 different personalities so you need to get all those personalities in alignment how do you do that by doing the same meditative practice at the same time of your morning you know you keep the routine the same in order to whip everybody into shape and everybody is just you so to whip yourself into shape you have to be doing the repetitive stuff and that's why it is 21 days because you know it, it's i like to work in uh in uh multiples of seven and i also like to work in multiples of three and you know what better than seven and three so you know, you get three days really for each chakra and it doesn't need to be that way, but, uh, you know, three days for each chakra and it can be, you know, what, okay. So when I say that, I mean, give it like time to crack, you know, it, it's kind of metaphorical is what I'm saying. It, it's not anything that, uh, that I didn't tell you that you were supposed to do or something, but it's just like, you know, I do three breaths. I try to do three breaths to each chakra every morning and, you know, do all seven that way and then crack them open. So I just like doing it on a small scale, larger scale, more grand scale, and then the largest scale. So, so I just, I try to make sure that I'm aligning every version of myself. And Veer Shanti really, when I talked to her, she really instilled that in me in that she said, the way that she broke up in her psychic abilities is her, I don't know if you remember the episode, her best friend died and her best friend was a studier at the Edgar Casey uh, Academy in Virginia. And she appeared to her in uh, like ghost form right in front of her face and like knocked her on her ass. And then she said to the universe, you know, I'm not going to 
do anything until you give me the ability to talk to the dead. And she said, no matter what I was doing, I would get drunk because, you know, she was going through it at the time, very depressed, sad, you know, all these types of things. And she said, you know, she was meditating with the purpose, no matter what she did, she meditated with the purpose of give me that ability. And now, boom, she's just like this non-human huge entity that just is like <laughs> so crazy psychically gifted that you would think she's been like would just place there but you know it's it was takes time and you said uh at the beginning of my little soliloquy you said uh you don't know if you're psychic and you are psychic you definitely are we all are psychic and see that's the thing about what I'm trying to help people realize is that we're all psychic. I'm not any more special than anybody. I am just to the point that I'm at so that I can help people get to this point, you know, it, and it, it really just comes down to when you unlock the level by doing whatever it is that you need to do to get to that next level. You know, it's, for some people it's, they have to leave their job in order to show their strength. Some people is they have to have their bank account run to almost empty for God then to replace it. You, your test, your faith will be tested. Your strength in every manner will be tested and you will be made to get bent over and spanked by God in so many different ways until you learn your lesson. We just don't see it that way. So once you do it in the right, you know, you're doing the right techniques at the right time and you're unlocking the right things, then all of a sudden the psychic abilities start flowing in and, you know, you'll be, you know, I don't know what, but you'll be doing crazy shit in no time. Man, you're, you're singing my song. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm going to revisit that Vera Shanti episode and maybe listen to it as I drift to sleep. Um, you're talking oh, about that'll be good. Emotions. She'll probably pour, uh, you know, she'll probably have a theric surgery performed on you. Overnight. Yep. Yeah. I'm going to ask for that. And then, you know, you, you're mentioning the emotions um, and how you come back to the meditation. It's like kind of like the principle of the scientific method, right? You, you have all these variables, but you have one control. You can always come back to it and measure everything against the universe in your life against that. And, um, you know, you talk about putting intention behind your meditation, asking for things and meaning it and putting the energy and the intention and getting a gift from a, from a psychic place. And what I hear myself saying is as I'm doing this, I am becoming complete. I'm becoming like a a stone structure that's flexible. It's not stone enough to crack, but a complete human being from top to tail, from inside to outside, from above, below, all that stuff. Um, that's the vision I'm starting to see is like a vision of solidifying right now. And I feel like I keep diving into it. Um, that's, that's the direction I'm headed with that. Okay. Well, hey, uh, you know, some episodes are more revealing than others. So, you know, that one, she blew my mind in that one. Like, she saw Mimi walk into my bedroom, and it was like, how the how did that happen? And and then she had, she saw my etheric surgeons and she started telling them where to do it. And then I started feeling it. And it's like, whoa, like I've never met someone who could speak to, you know, just the whole thing. It, it's just mind blowing. And to experience it, you know, to listen to it is one thing, but to, ha to experience that, that was like, that was something. And I had her and Christopher, the Astro medium back to back episodes. And, you know, super psychic lady, super psychic guy. And it was just like, whoa, it just like really unleashed something in me. I'm going to take a dip into the back catalog. It's so funny you just said the word dip. Because look what I just, look what I just circled right there. She just wrote. Dip. Okay, so I wrote three words. 
a couple seconds ago about she did. I looked over. <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> when you were uh talking about Todd and, and how he got so far so fast. So I was gonna tell you to dip. I was gonna tell you it's dedication, it's intention, and it's practice. And then you just said dip. And I circled the letters, the I P and then put the book to the side until just now. Synchronicities. Like <laughs> yeah. Dip indeed. Uh the practice is huge. Um, just you know, that's one lesson that I learned from music is uh <laughs> you gotta you gotta do that. Oh man, this is very interesting. This was such a, a fun conversation and you already <laughs> gave your grounding techniques. Uh let's see is is there anything else that uh you wanna you know, any last piece of information you wanna leave our audience with? Um, I just I think that you know the the I'll go back to the grounding thing because that's how you like to end every show. Um, and I just think it's important from that practical level to keep talking about those things. Um, just the meditation, um, taking care of your health, exercise on a regular basis, um, eating good food, and most importantly, eliminating eliminating the junk. Um, you know, getting getting over your habits. Um, I'm kicking the smoking habit as we discussed. Um, so staying on that track and every day just getting a little better. Uh, get back to the earth. Um, and we're all gonna do it together. And this is a fantastic journey. And um, yeah, I just I just wish the best for everyone. And I hope that the things I say on the show can help as many people out there as possible um i've been helped by your show so much and all your guests so i'm glad i could be a part of it and uh just want to say thank you so much again for having me oh uh, you're you're so welcome thank you so much for coming on and i know that your this episode is going to help a lot of people this was a very interesting episode very um the, the way we started you know talking about your world tour and all you know, i think a lot of people are going to be drawn in to that and you hit them with a lot of really good knowledge in here so you know i think that you're gonna definitely reach plenty of people all right glad i could be of service and share absolutely do you uh have anywhere where you want people to contact you can they find you yeah i started uh a new email address specifically for the show. So if anyone hears this episode and wants to reach out, it's uh, Dan the Manifester at protonmail.com. All right. Uh, and How I, about the farm? Is there a way for people hold, to... Hold, oh, we'll get to that in a second. Sorry, I just don't okay. want to forget this thought uh, <laughs> because he did send that to me with the review. and So I... If you want me to, I can add that on to the website. I didn't just because I wasn't sure. Please, yes, please add yeah. it. And just so everybody knows, like that review, so I asked Dan for a review. I didn't ask him to do anything specific or say anything, but I just asked him, you know, if you get a chance, can you give me a review? Uh, and so that review on my website is completely Dan's words, and, you know, that is 100% what, what he had to say. Yeah, it meant every word of it. Yeah, I'm sorry, Mimi. You were saying? Oh, I was wondering if uh, you had information on the farm for people that were uh, local to you, if they uh, wanted to purchase organic uh, meats. Through, can you do that through that farm? Can you get it directly Absolutely. from the farm? Absolutely. You can. Um, they have uh, a very good e commerce uh, ability. So if you want something shipped to you, we'll ship it to you. Um, if you want to come by, and take a tour of the farm. We give tours. Um, we we have a, a restaurant on the farm. Uh, e everything's available. I would say go to whiteoakpastures.com. Um, check us out. And if you order the goat or the lamb, uh, that's your boy right here, made with these hands as well as other hands. So I, I would highly suggest the lamb. Well, sticking with the theme of the show, uh, I think maybe and I have to take a road trip. Sure. I I'm think, always up for a road trip. I think yeah, we're gonna I'll give have you guys to. the personal tour. All right. All right. We. I don't know when we're gonna do it. We're gonna. We'll do it soon. So I don't. Do you want to talk about yeah. kid friendly too? This place is like we got like games set up. It's just like a little paradise and a little petting zoo. It's great. Right. We'll probably have well, to do it so next weekend away. or something. Yeah. 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 We're only a couple of hours. Yeah. Maybe next weekend because uh, you know 
my daughter's sick today, uh, so probably not this weekend wouldn't be a good idea, but that sounds like a really fun time, and you know, I don't think that I've ever eaten lamb, so, you know, it'd be serving, it'd be fitting that I, that the shepherd, you know, would, would, would serve be, lamb. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, please, if you're coming down, I'm getting tired, and I'll uh, give you the red carpet treatment as best I can. Oh, well, thank you so much. I, you know, I, I laugh, but it's just because that makes me feel so happy and, and uh, yeah, honored. You know, that's <sighs> life is just so wonderful. You know, how, how we get it from is. one place to the next. It's just like reflecting on my life. It's just like, how? How? I, yeah, I don't, God, I don't, know. Like, I don't even like... dare to explain it. Feels like pinball. It's like you just bounce into somebody, and they bounce you over here, and you bounce over there. Yeah. And you just collect all these points. <laughs> uh, all right. Maybe so. I bounced into you guys. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm I'm glad that I bounced into you first. Uh, that I, you know, that I went on uh, zero, and I got to share with Sam about Jesus, and I think that it really connected some things with him. And uh, he he said to me, he's like man, I know I'm going to be hearing from you sooner than later. And, uh, you know, it's just, you know, it's like a, a dream. In, I'm li- I listened to 500 plus of his episodes and then to be speaking with him, it was like, and actually the same shirt that I'm wearing now is what I wore on there. The lion and the lamb. How about that? I didn't even realize hey, the lamb. There you go. <laughs> yeah, Perfect. I, 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 yeah, the lion wow. and the lamb. How about that? Uh, it's all synchronicities. <laughs> I, and the other day you told me sheep, but we did, I don't think you mentioned lamb. I think you said sheep and goat the other day when we spoke. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, the, the lambs are the baby sheep. Okay, yeah. So we don't, even, we don't, we don't harvest we don't harvest the babies, but that's they're just it's just traditionally called lamb. Oh, okay. Ah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I did no, not know that. That feels better. <laughs> yeah, I did not know that. So there we go. Yeah, they live they live long, healthy lives and they are catered to twenty four seven, um, just like the creator intended. They get fresh water, fresh grass. They're moved every day. They never stay in the same place twice. Uh yeah, we, we care for them twenty four seven. So uh you know, we hope all that love energy that goes into these animals, um can can go into you and and feed you with some of the healthiest nutritious food on the planet made with love made with care well there you have it folks you have a musician turned farmer uh someone who didn't know god and then now knows god is everything and has always been there and you know and and my guest feels the same way. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, this is just how things go, is that God sets us up in these amazing ways, and we just get to experience all these new things when we finally surrender to it. And we, you know, I, I said it to Mimi the other day that I felt like I got backed into this corner of, making this website making this podcast but it, there was no corner i just made it an obstacle for myself because once i just turned around and started walking with the flow it's like oh this is what i'm supposed to be doing like i didn't know how to do a podcast and then i made my own website in like a six day span and it was like this amazing thing i was like so impressed with myself and so it's like man i should have just turned around earlier like we think we back ourselves into corners just so that we can turn around and go with the flow that's when we perform our best yeah we're back up against the wall up against the wall and then you you come out come out swinging yep take it from mimi she swings an awful lot absolutely (laughs) i like i like your addition the addition of your voice to the show oh thank you yeah, that's why I've been telling her. Like, she's uh, a good comic relief, and I like uh, bouncing things off of her. But you, you know, eventually the... my face will show more. But right now, I'm more comfortable uh, 
in this little beach chair. Right. <laughs> Too low for you to see me. Yeah, she'll be there soon. <laughs> Voice, voice is just fine. It adds a lot. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for telling her that she needed to hear it from someone other than me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I did. Um, so <laughs> there there you have it, guys. Uh, you know, hit up Dan on his Proton Mail. Uh, do you have any social media that uh, you're active on? I'm not. I'm not a big fan of social media in any regards. Yeah, me um, neither. Just hit me up via email and we'll, we'll chat. All right. Well, there you have it, folks. Uh, so hit Dan up. Hit me up. Check out the new web. Or, yeah, the new website. Uh, you can't become a member at the time of this recording. It's not available to become a member just yet. But you know, when it's available, I'll let everybody know, and you guys go check that out. And I highly suggest anybody listening that check out the tame your dragon aspect of the website. Because that is, you know, that's and the spiritual baptism, which is what Dan got. That's the beginning stages. And then, you know, the tame the dragon is like someone who's in it and is like, uh, and needs some guidance on what the fuck is happening. So I hope that you guys all check it out. And all, you know, all my stuff will, all the, uh, I always, yeah, a bit of a duh. Uh, all the, the links will be in the description for everything that we talked about. Well, not everything we talked about because apparently I forget to do that sometimes, but I'll put in the links that I remember to put in. How about that? <laughs> all right, everybody. We will talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.